Hey everybody, it's Elijah. I'm back. Really excited to be here. Um, thank you for joining me. So, okay, a few days ago, I don't know, I got the idea to make a full-length video talking about the different kinds of laws in the Bible because it's a question I get all the time, and to be honest, I didn't totally know how to answer it. So I wanted to really dive deep into a few books I have, read on the internet, watch some gnarly videos, and learn about the concept. Um, and I got some really helpful questions from you guys, and we're going to go through and answer all of them. Um, but the thing was, I kept learning more and having more questions, and there was just more I realized I had to talk about. And so this has become like a, like sort of a full-length course that's happening here. There's going to be a lot of content. Um, I believe I'm filming this in three total parts, so God help me. Um, <laughs> it's already midnight, but I'm going to get through this. We're going to be fine. Um, so, you know, pray for me. But I'm really excited about this. Um, and I'm going to ask you now, if you want the full value of this teaching, um, watch all three. I know that's kind of a time commitment, and there's going to be some kind of boring moments here and there. I'm going to do my best to infuse my personality here so you don't get tired of what's happening. Um, but watch all three, and I, I genuinely believe that it will bless you. I've been reading a ton, writing a ton. I probably did like eight total hours of just writing and studying studying for all this and learning so uh enjoy <laughs> um okay cool so what i'm talking about today is the mosaic law we call it the mosaic law because it's the law that god gave to moses um also called the sinaiic law because that's they were at mount sinai when god gave the law to them um and there were there are a lot of really great questions about the mosaic law a lot of people asked um you know which laws do we have to observe? Um, what does it mean that Jesus fulfilled the law? Do we still have to follow the Ten Commandments? All kinds of stuff like that. Um, what, what are the different types? Um, and so I'm going to answer all of those questions in these parts. There's just background knowledge and concepts that I have to explain first. So before I can talk to you about Mosaic Law, I have to explain the concept of covenant to you um, because the law, the Mosaic Law, was just a part of the Mosaic Covenant. Um, I just actually preached a sermon on the covenant that God made with Abraham um, in Genesis 15, and that's on my YouTube if you want to watch that. Uh, it's called the Genesis Gospel, and gave some pretty, I think, helpful definitions to the concept of covenant. But um, I'll re-explain them in simplified, shortened form here. So a covenant, if you don't know, is it's a biblical concept, comes up all the time. You've probably heard it if you grew up in church and probably don't know how to define it. Um, and that's fine. That's okay. That's what we're. That's what. That's what. We're, that's what I'm here for. That's what we're doing. Um, a covenant is a partnership between two parties. It's an agreement to work for mutual benefit. Um, now, when we talk about making a covenant with God, that definition isn't perfect. But the best analogies we have, the best kinds of covenant we have on earth, that parallel the kind of covenant we have with God. Um, I think the absolute best is a marriage covenant between a husband and a wife, where they're promising to love one another, to provide for one another, to take care of one another. Um, to work for one another um, and yeah you know like God being the husband in the scenario us being the wife you know we're the church um, called the bride um, God is in covenant with us and he promises to protect us to provide for us to lead us as the husband in the scenario so that's a good one we also have like um, like a business contract you know you're signing in you're a covenant we're working together that's what a covenant is it's a partnership um, it's a specific kind of relationship where, you know, terms and agreements between the two parties are laid out. And it's binding, which is a good thing. Binding doesn't normally have like a, a good connotation, but it's it's a good thing that we are bound to God by covenant and that he's bound to us by covenant, which is really cool and reassuring. Um, so the reason I bring up covenants is because that's going to help us to begin to look at the Bible as one narrative. Uh, we see God interact with lots of people throughout the Bible, and this is really just one narrative story. Um, you know, God interacts with time differently than we do, so he doesn't see it as him jumping into time at different points. It's it's not that he has changed, that he's changing the way he interacts with humanity over time. It's actually that he has been progressing in the way he interacts with humanity over time. That seeing its culmination and fulfillment in Jesus, and we're living in that um that case scenario now, and we'll see an increase in the way that humanity interacts with God in the eternal kingdom of heaven. Um, but so it's not that God himself is changing 
right? Obviously not. It's not that God is growing. We have to make that very clear. When I say he's progressing in the way he interacts with humanity, it's not because God is getting better. It's because he's choosing to like evolve in the way he up interacts with humanity over time because he has this plan of salvation that he began in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. So when we look at the New Testament and the Old Testament, we don't have two histories. We don't have two conflicting stories, and we do not, absolutely do not, pit the two testaments against one another. Um, they're not. They're one unfolding story. The New Testament is just a continuation of what was happening in the Old Testament. It's the completion of that story. Um, so the reason that people get confused about the Mosaic, the Mosaic Law is because they do not understand how it fits in with the rest of what God revealed before Moses and after Moses. Um, and so we see there's six major covenants in the Bible that I'm going to talk about now. There's more, um, but I'm just going to go through the ones that I think are most important. There's first the covenant he made with Abra well, Ab I don't even know where I was going with that. Adam, after the fall, the covenant he made with Noah, symbolized in the rainbow, cute. Um, the covenant he made with Abraham, which is what the sermon I just preached was about. The covenant he made with Moses, the covenant he made with David, and the new covenant, which is instituted and completed by Jesus. So, People don't understand where Moses, how Moses and the law fits in between Abraham and David are two good examples. We're just going to put like he's sandwiched in between Moses and the covenant God gave to Moses is right in the middle of God's process of revealing himself to humanity, of his process of entering into right relationship with humanity. Okay, so he's Moses is in the right in the middle of progress. So it's easy to get confused about what, what's happening. Um, something needs to be made very clear. Here's what that is. The covenant the partnership that God made with the people and with Moses is a furtherance of the principle of faith-based righteousness that God gave to Abraham. So the concept of being made righteous by faith is something that God showed in Abraham, right? It, got, it says in, in Genesis, Genesis 15, Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteous. Um, as righteousness. So Abraham was called righteous because of his faith. That has always been the prerequisite for righteousness throughout the entire Bible, New Testament and Old. We talked about being uh, in the New Testament justified by faith alone. That was the same that was the same principle that was applied to Abraham and to Moses. Um faith righteousness is a, is a principle is a concept that we see applied to Abraham, that we see applied to David, that we see applied because of Jesus, but it's also applied to Moses. Um the Mosaic law is not an ushering in of a covenant of works, which is what God first gave to Adam and Eve in the garden before the fall, where he required, required moral perfection as he interacted with them. Um, that's not what's happening here. God is not requiring moral perfection from the people in his revealing and giving of the law. The law is not a new way for people to be saved, okay? One of the main questions I got was, oh, how were the people back then saved by the law? They weren't. They weren't. God did not give them the law to show them how to be saved, right? That's not how that worked. We know this because the people were in slavery in Egypt and God rescued them, saved them from Egypt, and then gave them the law. Keeping the law, obeying the law, did not save them. It's never saved anyone, ever. Their faith in God did. God himself saved them. So the ideas that we believe in today of grace and faith preceded the law. They existed before the law even came. So we think that grace and faith are in contradiction to the law. They're not. They existed before the law did. And so we have to get out of this mindset where we believe that the law and obedience to the law was the way that people were saved in the Old Testament. That's not true. The people of God in the Old Testament were saved by their faith in the coming Savior. They believed in Jesus just like we did. They didn't know the exact parameters of what the coming Savior would do, but they had all these prophecies dating back to Genesis chapter 3 about Jesus and about the way that God would come and redeem and save mankind. And they believed in that coming Savior with faith. And they believed in the God of the universe with faith. They were not saved by works of the law. That's an important principle that we have down one, for our understanding of the law in general, but two, for when we later talk about how and why Jesus fulfilled the law, which we'll talk about in the second part. So, covenants out of the way. Now let's talk about the foundations of the law. So our first question, what is the law? <laughs> Buzz, this is, a, this is a golden question. We gotta get, get going here. The law is another step in the progressive revelation of who God is, okay? So again, it's not that God is changing. It's that God is showing more of who he is over time. So I want you to think of like 
are advancing telescope technology. Okay, so we've we've had telescopes for a long time, you know, beyond just our eyes. So we can sort of see planets in the sky, and then we built, you know, you know, some amateur elementary telescopes that could help us to see a little bit. And then you have the Hubble Space Telescope, just changes the game. And now we have these crazy HD, incredible zoom telescopes that help us to see like the the surfaces of planets and stuff is ridiculous. And so that's kind of how it is. So think about it. We are being given a better telescope. Okay, humanity is being given better telescopes over time. God is the planet. It's not that the planet is changing. Our telescope technology is. So God is giving us better ways and more detailed ways to see who he is. He's not changing. And so that revelation that happens here is that God shows them how he wants people to live and behave. In other words, in other words, the law is the totality or summation of God's will for people, for his people and how he wanted them to live. And he gives that to them and and into Moses in the form of 613 rules, 613 total laws. I'm not going to go through all of them. Obviously, that's ridiculous. Um, There are different kinds of laws within there. But before I can actually get to that, we have to break down different kinds of laws and classifications that we have of basic laws. And we're going to break those down before we can get super specific. So there's two classes of laws, four total types that I want to look at. They're going to help us, that are going to help us understand the specific laws that God gave to his people. So the first distinction is between natural law and revealed law. So natural law, okay, that's every man's ability, their innate ability to recognize right and wrong. This is something you are born with. Um, This is the reason why a lot of societies have similar moral codes because God has implanted a sense of right and wrong within us. Um, And so there's a natural law that everybody has no matter where they are. The Bible addresses this concept in Romans chapter 2 verses 14 through 15 where Paul says, Indeed, When Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. So morality is a part of who we are. Um, We may not always agree. We may debate about what's happening in this heart, but we have a general sense of right and wrong written within us. Now, that's natural law. The second kind of law is revealed law and that's everything we're going to be talking about from here on out revealed law revealed law is the rules given to us directly by god that either affirm natural law what we know in our hearts or show us something that we could not have otherwise known so there's like no way that we could have known that something was right or wrong according to god's law unless he specifically told us because it wasn't something written on our hearts implanted in our minds so revealed law increases the the specificity of God's desires for humanity. Revealed law is everything we're talking about tonight. And revealed law is found, not tonight, in this video. It's night time for me. Um, But revealed law is found in the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, which means, the word Torah means law. (laughs) It's crazy. It's crazy. Oh my gosh, maybe that was on purpose. Um, (laughs) And it's mostly found in the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So four out of five. So that's the two, that's the first class. The second class of law that we have to address is, and I had not heard of these before I started studying, apodictic versus casuistic laws. Apodictic versus casuistic, okay? So casuistic laws are laws that pertain to specific cases. Hence, casuistic, case case quasalistic. In essence, they're basically saying that casuistic laws are written and phrased, if this happens, then this. If this thing happens, then this is what you do. If this circumstance, then this consequence. All of our laws in America are casuistic. Um, or cas- 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 I think there's a zzz on there. Casuistic laws. They're based totally on circumstance. With an example of this in the Bible, in Numbers chapter 35, And that's a bunch of laws on manslaughter. Manslaughter is when you kill somebody on accident. Um, And the cities of refuge. You can go through and read it. It's really boring, but it's an interesting um, little case there. Basically, it's talking about manslaughter. And it basically reads as if someone is saying, oh, what what about this? What if this happens? What if it's like this? What if it's like this? And that's sort of what's happening. It's a streak of questioning regarding the law and answering all the specific scenarios. And 
um, and what should be done in those cases. That's casuistic law. It's based on cases. So it's like, okay, if they kill them with an iron tool, it's like, well, what if someone, what if they're like, what if they kill them with a stone tool? Okay, if they kill them with a stone tool, then it's like, well, wait, okay, what about a wooden tool? If they kill them with a wooden tool, and it goes through and answers all these questions, talks about motive. It's interesting. It's all based on small differentiations in case um, so that the people would know what to do if they encountered those circumstances. The second kind of law, apodictic law, are laws strictly based on God's moral character that are to be upheld in every circumstance. They're absolute. There is no getting around them. They are always true of what is right and wrong. Always. So this is like phrased, thou shalt not. Thou shalt not do this. Thou shalt not do that. It's like the Ten Commandments are our example of apodictic, divinely given law. Now, I want to go through the different kinds of laws that we specifically see in the Mosaic Law that help us to understand, you know, what we're supposed to follow, what that law is supposed to look like, and help us to see, um, you know, a foretelling of the coming Messiah. So before we can do that, we have to make one thing very clear. You and I cannot hold a view of the revealed law to Moses that is strictly spiritual. Uh, Sincere Cordona from Theos U. Uh, which is super gnarly resource on in his course on covenants said that there is no dichotomy there was no dichotomy between the secular and the sacred everything is just running side by side so the spiritual laws and the practical laws are running side by side moses and aaron the two leaders of israel at the time were effectively operating a theocracy together so a government built on religious principle so it's a bit different than what we're experiencing but they had laws just like we do and that is how they viewed them as laws we have to like stop separating the concepts, thinking that they had some like special different kind of law. Um, that you know what laws are. You know, we obey laws all the time. You know what laws are. Their laws may have been God given, but they had the same function, um, and they had a lot of similar laws. Okay, so we have to remember that they were a nation. They were a people group. They needed regulation and laws, just like we do. The thing is, is they didn't have a legislative body. They didn't have a Congress. So God gave them those kinds of laws directly. Here's what it says in the Gospel Transformation Study Bible. The Mosaic Law was intended to govern Israelite society when it functioned as a nation state. It had to include legislation for governing all those who lived within the boundaries of political Israel, whether their hearts had been transformed by God or not. So there's all these people who are living in Israel and functioning together. There had to be some kind of secular law given to them. So the law that they followed and obeyed wasn't like strictly spiritual. It had to do with like basic everyday life. All that being said, in interpreting the law, scholars today have divided the laws into three different categories. But I said everything I just said so that you would know that the Jews themselves did not draw these distinctions. So we're going to look at three different categories. The first category of Mosaic law, moral laws. So these are laws concerning God-given ideas about right and wrong. These are those apodictic principles we were talking about. They are unchanging rules about what is holy and what is sinful, what is right and what is wrong. So we see the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, verses 2 through 17. Those are the moral laws. The church has agreed about this for a very long time. Here's what St. Irenaeus said about the Ten Commandments. From the beginning, God had implanted in the heart of man the precepts of the natural law, then he was content to remind him of them. This was the Decalogue. This was the Ten Commandments, where God specifically or explicitly declared the, ten, the natural law that was written on man's heart, said in word and confirmed on stone the things that every man knew in his heart. Now, not everybody agrees with such a narrow view of the moral laws. Sometimes they just put them, or not everyone agrees with an interview view of the moral law like that, where we just say it's the Ten Commandment, the Ten Commandments, but that's because they didn't add the following subgroup. So the second group of law that we have to address is the civil or judicial law. So the Westminster Convention, Convention, I'm troubled with my words today. The Westminster Confession of Faith, which is um, the Reformed Confession of Faith, calls them the civil laws, and Thomas Aquinas, Catholic Church father, called them the judicial laws. Pretty titles, they both mean the same thing. So, the civil laws are all the moral laws following the Ten Commandments. This distinction that we're talking about is helpful because these laws pertained more to, like, cultural participation rather than, like, simple morality, rather than just what is right and what is wrong. Um, they are the Ten Commandments applied to day-to-day -day life. 
Um, so in other words, we can define them as laws pertaining to human interactions and then how the leaders of the people were meant to carry out and enforce morality. So like all the laws we have in America are civil laws. Um, and that being said, all our laws are also case-based. They're also casuistic, which these laws, the civil laws, are. So like we talked about, the moral laws are apodictic. They are true about what is right and wrong always. Um, the civil laws tell us about specific circumstances, specific cases, and what is right and wrong to do in those circumstances. The main difference between simple moral laws and civil laws is that civil laws are contingent upon specific circumstances, whereas the Ten Commandments were universal, meaning the only contingency was being human. Okay, so the only thing, the only prerequisite for those things being right was whether or not you were human. Okay, uh, so for example, we look at the Ten Commandments, which can be divided into two sections. The first four are about man's relation to God, and the second six are about man's relation to other men. Okay, so we're talking about being in right standing and living morally in relation to God and relation to people. So the only conditions necessary to break any of the Ten Commandments are one, the existence of God, and two, the existence of neighbors. And those are universal experiences. God and other people are realities for everyone, okay? But when we talk about the civil law, okay, for example, for a sorceress to be put to death, as it says in Exodus 22, 18, there must first be a sorceress, right? Or for someone to curse a ruler of the people, as it says not to do in Exodus 22, 28, there must first be a ruler, and so on and so forth. So those are the civil laws. And finally, we'll look at the third category, the ceremonial laws. This is the ones that people get the most confused about. These are the ones that typically tend to be a little bit strange for us sometimes. Um, but the ceremonial laws were concerning the people's connection to God. It was concerning their relation to God, how they related to God. So that whether that be in maintaining their connection to God through sacrifices, cleansing rituals, altar construction, weirdly enough, etc. Um, so maintaining their connection, remembering their connection to God. Uh, so God commanded, you know, different feasts and festivals like the Passover, the Feast of Booths, all kinds of things for them to come together and remember what God had done and the way they were connected to him. Or the third, to exemplify or show their connection to God. So that came with like food laws, um, which also, yeah, food laws, bad haircuts that they had to have, um, clothing, they couldn't mix fabrics, and tattoos even. Tattoos is an example um, where they had to show that they were the people of God, that they were connected to God by the way that they looked, um, these outward physical signs. Um, and then in the ceremonial laws, some contain laws specifically for the priests, and then some, uh, or some of the laws are specifically for the priests, and then some are for all people to abide by, um, all people of God to abide by. So those are the three different kinds of laws. That's how we break them down. Now, you may feel, still feel confused about those categories, which ones we're supposed to obey and all that. I'm going to address all that in the second part. Before I do that, I want to answer the question, why? Okay, so we know what the law is. I want to answer the question, why did God give the law? Because this is important to the life of Jesus as well. So, why did God give the law? We'll get there. Thirsty, parched, living water. Um, before we can begin on answering this question, it's important to me that you know and you are aware of the ancient Israelite people's attitude towards the law, okay? Because we have an incredibly low view of the law. We think of the law as being like a bad thing. We think of it in, we have like a word association for law in legalism. Um, and so we consider the law to be binding, restricting, gross, bad, the worst thing ever, just taking all our fun away. But that's not what the Israelite people thought. Uh, Linwood Urban, in his book, A Short History of Christian Thought, said that pious Jews have always understood the law to be a manifestation of God's love. They saw it as a divine gift. Psalm 119, which is the longest chapter in the entire freaking Bible, is about the law. It's about the law of God. It's not about the the Pentateuch. Or it, no, it is about the Pentateuch, because that's what that's the first five books of the Bible. It's not about the uh, Tanakh in totality, which is the whole uh, Old Testament. It's not about the t scriptures that were to come. It's about the first five books of the Bible written by Moses. And David specifically says, in the middle of this super long, honestly, super overrated, terribly boring psalm, he says, for I delight in your commands because I love them. 
The people had an, a love and appreciation for God's laws. Why? Because they were the only people with those laws. And when they lived and abided by them, it worked out. Like they realized it was just better to follow the laws that had given. It's like they had cheat codes where um, now they're not just living. Every other people group is living totally based off natural law. It turns out that the revealed law of God is more helpful. And so they had a love for God's law. Okay. Why? It does. Why? Because of what it did. It did five things that I'm going to name. It did a, It did many, many things. Um, led to a lot of executions. Psh, sick! Um, but I want to talk about five things um, that the law did. Five reasons that God gave the law. So reason number one, it reveals exactly how holy God is. Okay? God gives this law that establishes what moral perfection looks like. Even though he didn't expect moral perfection from the people, it showed them how high the standard was for moral perfection. Most of them probably thought they were doing pretty good, and the law comes along, and they're like, wow, this God is so holy, his standard is so high. Um, it also showed how careful they had to be in relating to him, which again revealed his holiness. There were all these very meticulous, specific rules about sacrifice and the priestly, the, the priesthood and, and relating to God, all these very, very, very specific rules they had to follow, and it was like, wow, this God is not playing games. He's very holy. Um, and then it shows that this God, Yahweh, was not like the other Near Eastern deities. So when we talk about the Hebrew people, we have to understand that they weren't technically, in ancient times, monotheistic. While they are today, they were not monotheistic at this time. They were more likely, as scholars agree, monolatristic, okay? Monolatristic people believe in a whole multitude of deities, but they only have dedication and commitment to one of them. Okay, so they are solely committed to God, called Yahwehists, um, solely committed to the God of the Bible, um, dedicated to him, living for him, but they acknowledge that there were all other kinds of deities and believe that they were real. Well, when God reveals himself in this way, these people who were used to the gods of Egypt, um, as that's where they were enslaved and knew about the gods of Canaan and all these other places, would have real seen what this God was like as he revealed himself to them and just would have been like, whoa, this God is so different. This God is so different from all the other gods. And that's what holiness means, that he's set apart, that he's different, that he's above. And so it would have showed his aboveness. It would have showed his greatness. Um, his holiness is what it reflected. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, said that the law is an incorruptible picture of the high and holy one that habits eternity. It's an incorruptible picture. It shows how high and holy our God is. In light of that, the second reason that God gave the law, the second thing that it accomplishes, is that it gives humanity a clearer definition of sin. So before, the God, before God gave the law to Moses, the only way to define sin was disobedience of a direct command from God. And that's still true, right? That's still a true thing. It's just that the commands that God has given have been widened beyond just personal words from God, right? The, the only way you could break a command at this point before the law, was if you heard God audibly tell you to do something, okay? So that was the only definition of sin. So like Abraham sinned, um, you know, by going against specific commands because he audibly heard from God. Um, this widens the will of God to everybody, okay? And so it shows everyone what sin means, or what it means to sin, because it shows them what they can and can't do. It shows them what's right and wrong, and if they break any of the commands, they are in sin. So Paul expresses this idea in Romans chapter 7, verse 7. He says, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. So it reveals what sin actually is. Um, the third thing that the law accomplishes is it protects God's people. Now, hearing that, your first thought is probably not like, when we talk about the law, your first thought is probably not like, oh, it protects the people, and it's looking out for the people, and it's it's keeping them safe and guarding them. That's probably not the first thing you think of, um, and that's because many Christians, again, have a low view of the law. We view biblical commands as being restricting and burdensome, but that's not why, how the Israelites viewed them, though they fully acknowledged how difficult it was to always obey them. Um, here's what it says in Psalm 119, 1. Love this verse. I talk about it constantly. It says, Blessed are those who walk according to the law of the Lord. That first word, blessed, translates most directly to be to superlative happiness. In other words, people who walk according to the law of the Lord are as happy as they can possibly be. 
life is better when you obey God. That's just like how it goes. God knows what's up. He knows what he's doing. He knows how humans work. Life is better when you obey him. We see that when we break any of God's commands, breaking any of God's commands will always lead to damage in our relationships. They'll damage our, breaking the commands will damage our relationship with God. It will damage our relationship with other people and it will damage our relationship with ourselves. And so we see that God's law protects us and it protects others from us, okay? Um, as an example, and this is what actually inspired me to make this whole teaching, but again, I just kept thinking of new questions and new ideas and I wanted to do something more exhaustive. Um, but this is initially where I was at. I wanted to show people how we can look at the Ten Commandments and see how breaking those commandments will always hurt us, how they're actually a guideline and a boundary that keeps us safe from the evil things outside, um, which plays into the role of God as a shepherd. So let's, so let's read. Let's go through the Ten Commandments. The first commandment, do not have other gods before me. Okay, listen, having other gods will always be damaging to your soul because you were made to worship the one triune God alone and live in his image. So this command talks about who we worship. Worshiping any other God will lead to us doing empty, broken things. We will not be fulfilled and we will ultimately be deformed as we make ourselves into the image of whatever we're worshiping. So this command is about who you worship. The second command, do not create idols, is about how we worship. Right? This commandment forbids us from worshiping God the wrong way. Right now, and they back then, if we tried to worship God through idols, he would not accept that. He's defined specific ways that we are supposed to worship him. Today, for us, it's in spirit and in truth. Um, but he defines specific ways for them to worship him. And if they tried to worship God any other way, he would not accept it. And that would damage their relationship with God, which is not a good thing. Commandment number three, do not take God's name in vain. Listen, when we take God's name in vain, we are reflecting and perpetuating a low view of God in our words. And that's ultimately going to damage the, damage the way that you, inter you interact with him. If you're willing to talk about God in a low way, eventually you'll begin to think about him in a low way. And that is damaging because he is the holy of holies, the God on high. The fourth command, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. God commands that we rest. He commands that we rest. Why? Because if you don't rest, you're going to burn out. You're going to exhaust yourself and you will eventually fall away from the Lord because you're so focused on working instead of worshiping. So those ones are a, like a little bit harder to see how God's heart is to protect. But in the second six, it becomes a lot more obvious. So commandment number five, honor your father and mother. So this commandment actually comes with a promise that your days may be long, that you'll live a long time if you obey your parents. Um, and so dishonoring them means that you are dis, or you'll live a long time if you honor your parents, meaning that if you dishonor them, your life's going to get cut short. <laughs> but even if you don't want to be superstitious, we can just acknowledge that dishonoring your parents is always going to create chaos for you. Always. It's just not a fun thing to be in conflict with your parents. Commandment number six, uh, don't murder. Don't murder people. Um, laws like this in a society where everyone is seeking to obey the law, right? They keep everyone safe because it keeps you from murdering people and it keeps people from murdering you, which is really awesome because nobody, nobody wants to be murdered. Nobody wants to be murdered. Commandment number seven, don't commit adultery. Or in other words, don't have intimate relations with someone outside of the context of God-established marriage. Do you know, do you want to know what in the future, okay, when I am married, potentially, potentially, would <laughs> ruin my marriage, wreck my life, and totally hurt my spouse, hurt my wife, like just ruin her, um, cheating on her, cheating on her. That would be really bad. That would really suck. It would ruin my marriage, shipwreck my life completely, hurt my kids, hurt my wife, disrupt my, just disrupt everything. It'd be chaotic and troublesome for me. If you avoid adultery, you avoid trouble. You avoid pain. You also avoid the consequence of someone breaking the sixth commandment. Because if you cheat, she's going to kill you, right? Like if I cheat on her, she, I'm going to get a knife in the back. So, um, <laughs> so not cheating uh, lengthens my life. So this, this commandment should come with a promise as well, I think. I'm being sarcastic. I'm just not very funny at the moment because I'm so focused. Okay, commandment number eight, don't steal. Again, that's protecting other people from you and protecting you from other people because stealing sucks. Stealing is not fun for anybody. It's the worst. Commandment number nine, don't lie. Same idea. Protecting you from other people, protecting other people from you. And we know that eventually those lies are going to catch up to you, okay? And that's going to that's gonna kick, kick you right in the rear end. And commandment number 10, do not covet. 
or want something that belongs to someone else so much that it's your sole desire and you become opposed to them because of it. Why? Why don't we covet? Because envy rots the freaking bones. Envy rots the bones. When we live content lives, you'll be at peace with where you are, with how you stand with God, and with everyone around you. And living in peace is way better than living in not peace. <laughs> so you see what I mean? The, the laws that God gave serve the purpose of protecting the people from the consequence of sin. I mean, there, there are other examples too outside of the Ten Commandments. I'll bring up tattoos again. Tattoos. Um, why is that protective? Oh, because we're talking about 3,000 to 4,000 years ago and you have these like slowly growing societies with very small amounts of medicine, if any at all. I mean, they're rubbing plants in your wounds and they are just using and reusing needles on all kinds of people. Like you're going to get diseases and die if you get tattoos, bro. It's going to kill you. It's, they don't have tattoo guns. They are hammering ink into your ripped open flesh. That is not good for you. You're going to get eat ink poisoning. So God's like, hey, guys, uh, don't get tattoos right now and cut open your flesh so that you can fill it with ink because that you're going to die from that. Another one, circumcision on the eighth day. God commands that circumcision happens on the eighth day. Yes, it parallels the creation narrative, but also it happens that right around the eighth day is the healthiest, best time to circumcise infants because of like the, the development that happens in that first week of life. So God's laws are not causeless. Um, they're not they're, they're 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 not stupid. They're not bad. They're always guarding something or someone, and and keeping something safe from the corruption that comes with sin. So that's reason number three. Reason number four, fourth reason God gave the law was to set His people apart. So God's initial will for the nation of Israel was for them to live as the children of Abraham, to live such holy lives that they would spread their holiness and their dedication to Yahweh to all of their neighbors, that everyone around them would become followers of Yahweh and they would choose to live holy, righteous lives. And that's like the promise and the will that God shows Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, when he talks about reaching the nations through Abraham's children. This is the reason that like the Israelites went to war, because they were surrounded by nations that were killing and eating their babies and their streets were full of like impoverished, starving people, and there are all kinds of injustice. Like we have a Sodom and Gomorrah situation. God used Israel to destroy evil and show good. The problem is that that didn't come true. Israel actually became more evil than the people around them. So we don't see the ultimate end of some of these ceremonial laws. We don't see their exact purpose um, come true in Israel. But sure enough, the purpose of those laws was to set the people apart from other nations so that they would clearly stand out and that they... that everyone would know who they worshipped and the God that they were following. So that's why they didn't mix fabrics so that p people could be like, look at that guy who his shirt is, his uh, robe is only one fabric. He must uh, be one of, one of those guys uh, from Israel. Or they didn't eat shellfish. People were like, well, you know, that's real commitment. I really love me some selfish. That's really admirable that you're not going to do that. Or they didn't get tattoos. Again, Oh, that's so cool that your skin is a blank slate because I love using tattoos um, to dedicate myself to pagan deities all the time. So that's cool that you do that. <laughs> okay, you see my point? It, it helped them to stand out physically. It was an outward sign of the God that they were following. And finally, the fifth reason, the fifth and final reason that God gave the law was because it looked forward to the Messiah. You have to remember that concept of covenant I talked about in the beginning. This revelation of who God was was showing something about the coming Messiah and how he would be the culmination of God's plan, right? The law looked forward to the one who would fulfill the law. The, the system that was established in the Mosaic Covenant looked forward to a better system. It looked forward to the one person who would come and fulfill everything that's happening here. And that is what we'll talk about in part two. So join me there. Love you guys. Thank you for watching all the end of this one. And I'll see you in the next part. Tally ho. Bye.